Looks like you need a vacation. Enter the five-hour energy Where Will the Tide Take You sweepstakes. You could win a $10,000 dream beach vacation. Imagine jet setting off to a tropical paradise, having fun in the sun, or diving at a gorgeous reef. It's up to you. No purchase necessary. Go to 5hetide.com for official rules and to enter. That's 5hetide.com. Enter today. Ends June 30th, 2024. Hi, everyone. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Welcome to Yoga Birth Babies, a podcast produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. We will be diving into everything prenatal yoga, birth, and baby-related, hoping to inspire, educate, and empower you through your journey into motherhood. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Deb Flaschenberg. I'm your host for Yoga Birth Babies, and today we are talking about baby-led weaning, when and how to introduce foods to your baby. And I have Jenny Best as my speaker. She is the founder and CEO of Solid Starts. Jenny is a mom of three, including fraternal twins. Jenny is a food and farming expert and communication strategist. Prior to the food world, she served in Mike Bloomberg's mayoral administration and was a professional ballerina with New York City Ballet. Jenny lives in Brooklyn, where she currently neglects over 30 edible plants on her rooftop. Wow, that's very impressive. If I had 30 plants, I probably would neglect them too. I think you'll really enjoy this conversation. Not only is Jenny entertaining and delightful and a hoot to speak with, she really is knowledgeable. We talk everything about allergens. We talk about the difference between gagging and choking. Gagging is fine. Choking, not so much. And how to even introduce what foods? Are we still doing purees? We're going more finger foods. She has some really amazing advice. Before we get to that conversation, I just want to say a shout out and a thank you to everyone that's gone on and left a rating and review for Yoga Birth Babies. It helps people find us. If you haven't done that, please take a moment and do so. I really appreciate your time and effort. Also, let me tell you a little bit about our future and online classes. It's here to stay. We have been surveying our community about the possibility of when we're going to open and what to do with our live streaming. And we have had people saying, even when we open the doors, please keep the live streaming classes going. And we will. It's a new part of what we're going to offer. If you haven't had a chance, check out our live streaming classes. We do them every morning, seven days a week. And then we send you the link. So if you say you signed up for the 10 a.m. but you forgot or you couldn't get there, don't worry. You're going to get the link and you can watch it anytime between the next 24 hours. We also re-release that same class uh, twice during the day. So it's kind of our offering of on-demand and it's going to keep going. We don't know where this virus is going, but we do know that we are going to keep this going. So check out our classes. Please enjoy our community. Also, a heads up, the fall online teacher training is full with a wait list. So we're looking to do a winter online and then hopefully, fingers crossed, we're back in the studio for the spring. We It's such a joy to work with so many people. And having the teacher training online, we have people from all over the world outside New York who's taking the training. And I'm really, really honored to be their teacher and to have this experience. And then last little thing, for those people that are teachers and you want to dive deeper into pre and postnatal yoga, but you're not ready for a whole 85 hour training, check out my two online courses. You can do it on your own timing. Who's afraid the pregnant yogi and teaching the postnatal student. Go ahead and find that from our website or teaching the postnatal student.com. Who's afraid the pregnant yogi.com or everything's at prenatal yoga center.com. All right. I think I've talked enough. I've given you a lot of announcements. We're going to take a super quick break and we come back. Let's talk about some baby led weaning. This podcast is sponsored by Skylight Calendar. Let's be real. Running a household can be exhausting and chaotic. And finding the perfect Mother's Day gift, it's not exactly a no-brainer. Until now. The Skylight Calendar is the best way to organize the family and give everyone, especially mom, some peace of mind to enjoy the things that matter most. The Skylight Calendar is a smart, touchscreen calendar that keeps track of and manages the chores, dinner planning, groceries, and to-dos for the whole family. The Skylight Calendar automatically syncs each family member's digital calendars and displays them all together on one color-coded touchscreen. It even doubles as a digital picture frame, so you can finally share all those special moments that are just sitting on your phone. 
As a limited time offer for our listeners, get 15% off your purchase of a Skylight calendar when you go to skylightcal.com slash easy. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-C-A-L dot com slash easy. Get 15% off your Mother's Day purchase now at skylightcal.com slash easy. Hi, Jenny. How are you? Hi, Deb. So good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to jump in and, and, um, and talk with you. Really, really flattered. Thank you. Well, I'm excited because I think, I feel like I'm an old mom. My kids are six and eight, so it's not that long ago. But as I was reading <laughs> more about baby led waning, I'm like, gosh, I did things wrong or now it's exciting. So I'm really excited to talk to you. I'm also excited to learn about you as a person. As I was reading your bio, <laughs> I'm like, wow, she's kind of done it all, especially that you were a ballerina from City of LA because yeah. um, prenatal yoga centers on the Upper West Side. So we've had a lot of ABT and City Ballet dancers come through. Oh, nice. Sure. Yeah. Maria was there was four or five years ago. We had Julie Kent there. Like it's just been as a former, I was never a ballerina. I was always musical theater, but I always was kind of in awe of all our ballerinas that came through. So, it's oh. <laughs> so yeah. I miss the neighborhood. I, I miss that part of my life, but it was a long time ago now. <laughs> yeah. So you've kind of done it all when I was reading, like you were part of Mike Bloomberg's mayoral administration. Like, wow. All right. So let's go into that. Let's hear. <laughs> I'm really interested to hear a little bit about you and how you went from mayoral administration professional ballerina to now with your solid stars program. I it's all things, baby food. Yeah, (laughs) sure. Sure. I mean, I have a really unusual story. I was, I was born in Nevada and from as early as I can remember, I wanted to be a ballerina. I mean, I'm, I was asking my mom if I could move to New York so I could dance on Broadway or, you know, what have you, um, probably starting around like age 10. And, you know, the answer was always no, 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 no. And then finally they started to catch on that this was not going to change. (laughs) And, um, I, uh, ended up moving here in my teens and was, um, a member of the New York City Ballet eventually. Um, gosh, I think I was 17 when I joined. That was my first job and it was a full-time job. And I was on my own in an apartment in New York, living, living the life. Um, and five years into that, I severely injured my back. Um, Mm. I I like to say that I broke my back because it was a number of fractures that led to the, to the injury. It's the easiest way to understand it, but it completely ended my career. And I had about a year of bed rest, um, to recover from that initially. And, All I remember is my doctor looking at me after he got the x-rays and the MRI and everything back. And he said, well, how does Broadway sound? Because he knew that I could never dance on point again or to like the extremity of what the New York City Ballet is in terms of the, you know, flexibility required and all of that. So um, I opted not to dance anymore and to um, put myself back through college. So I went to NYU and graduated in three years because I was older than everybody else (laughs) and really uncomfortable. And, you know, in that time, 9-11 happened. Um, and it was a really sort of poignant, um, uh, part obviously in our city's history, but uh, for me as a student and an older student. So I quickly switched my major Um, which was economics at the time, to um, poli-sci and got very into civic uh, service and landed a a job in Mike Bloomberg's administration as my sort of first real job out of college. And I think at the time, I didn't even really know who he really was. You know, I hadn't been in finance or anything like that. He, it wasn't a, he wasn't a household name for me, um, which is to say, I didn't know how good <laughs> I had it for that to be one of my first jobs. So was, for the most part, for the first few years of my career, I was sitting a couple seats away from the mayor and um, supporting his um, advance team and preparing him for public events and, and whatnot, um, learning a ton just by watching and listening and, and all of that. So, uh, fast forward a decade and I was really burned out 
really tired of having so many blackberries and so many laptops and middle of the night black conference oh, calls. I was yeah, thinking, yeah. I was thinking actually blackberry. I was thinking actually the yogurt. What was that called? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I know what you're talking different. about. Yeah, no, I had, I had two blackberries, the actual devices. Oh my gosh. That <laughs> takes me back way. to a long time ago. <laughs> I know. And you know, I, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to take like three months off. I'm not going to travel. I, I just want three months off in between this job and my next job to like ground myself, recalibrate, figure out what I want to do with the rest of my life. Cause I loved serving that administration. We did a lot of good work and I learned so much from everyone there. Um, but the reality is I wasn't I wasn't going to be in politics for my whole life. It wasn't my passion. Um, So I fell in love with food and food culture and food history and the politics of food and food sustainability and agriculture and everything that sort of surrounded that. And, you know, it probably is some kind of overreaction to having not been able to eat that much food as a ballerina for the majority of my life. But um, for whatever reason, it, it just became all consuming and this wonderful part of my life. So uh, I spent a, a decade working for various um, food nonprofits and social enterprises. And then I became a mom. And, you know, the game just changed um, in, in wonderful ways. I started working from home. I now have a four year old and uh, twin toddlers. And, you know, my basic story is I, you know, as much as I knew about food, I mean, I'm the chair of the board of trustees at the Museum of Food and Drink in New York. (laughs) As much as I knew about food, when I got to introducing solid food to my firstborn, Charlie, had no idea where to begin. I had no idea what I was doing. And I was really afraid really afraid. And, you know, I spoon, I think because I was so afraid and he had allergies and everything else, but because I was so afraid, I spoon fed him for way too long. Like I'm embarrassed to say even how long I was probably well past his first birthday and, you know, never gave him anything textured or finger foods. I was terrified of choking terrified when I would see him gag. Um, and just everything was based out of fear. Well, you know, by his first birthday, he pretty much stopped eating. He just, he wouldn't open his mouth for the spoon. We had to do the singing and dancing and bring out the iPad and whatever else to just get him through a meal. And it really spiraled down um, pretty quickly. It was really stressful. It was one of the hardest times in my life. And he started to wither away. Um, we were like, a step away from having one of those food packs like installed on his body, like a feeding tube with a pack. Um, so it was really devastating, not only on me, but our whole family. And, you know, so when the twins came around when I was pregnant, I just thought I'm going to do this differently this time, because if you trace back the steps that I took with introducing solid food to Charlie, And I don't like to beat myself up too much about this because I don't want moms to do that. But the reality is, is I did kind of make every mistake in the books. You know, Um, I spoon fed too long. I limited the variety of food to only the things that were like super healthy, like kale purees and you know whatever. Um, And I didn't let him even reach for the spoon to grab it, even when he wanted to. You know, I was really kind of controlled about it. Didn't want him to make a mess. Always wiping his face. Well, it turns out all those things are pretty strong indicators that your child's going to end up a picky eater. So um, when I had the twins, I started researching different ways of introducing solids, came across baby led weaning, and it just clicked for me. It made total sense. It felt a lot, um, in a lot of ways, kind of consistent with um, the Montessori method of child rearing, of like putting independence you know, putting a a priority on on independence. And so I thought, okay, this is what we're going to do. Four days in to the twins solids, solid food journey. I was like, my mind was blown. I couldn't believe that these six month old babies were self-feeding and so happy 
going at it and trying different things all by themselves. And I was just like, okay, this, this is my life's work now. (laughs) Everyone needs to know about this because this is totally life-changing. And I think they do because I remember when, I'm so glad you're doing this because I really think some people are still like, I remember when my kids are a little older, they're six and eight, but I was one of the few that didn't start with like rice, rice cereal. Mm -hmm. I started my kids with both of them with avocado. We literally spread a shower curtain on the floor. Nice. (laughs) Squished up an avocado and we just, it it was a a hot mess. Um, I mean, like in the hands, in the face, in the diaper. I don't know how it got in the diaper, in the hair. I mean, it was (laughs) everywhere. We did that with both kids. It was also really kind of hilarious. Um, yeah, but you know, it's, but I, I felt like such the rebel then because it, yeah. and then I, oh, my, my mother and my mother-in-law are like, you can't do that. That's not right. Yeah. It has to be rice cereal. So I'm just so excited to learn about this new method. Cause this wasn't that long ago that I was hearing this, you know, yeah. that, you know, how we even got to rice yeah. cereal as the yeah. I mean, it's empty calories. So I guess one yeah. of the things, um, I don't think people always know. Can you explain what baby led weaning even means? Sure. Absolutely. Um, So basically, you know, baby led weaning is introducing solid food to a baby by starting with finger foods and letting the baby self feed a hundred percent. So no purees, um, though you could use a puree, but you would let your baby kind of hand scoop and finger paint, right? Um, but no spoon feeding, um, no putting the mouth, you know, putting the food in the child's mouth and letting them independently um, feed themselves, which by six months old, all, you know, sort of on track developing babies are able to do. Um, so, you know, how did we get here? I, you know, it's funny. I, when you really think about things and you study the history of baby food, which we have done, um, it's a really interesting <clears throat> arc. The, the reality is, is that we call, we have a, a method called baby led weaning. Now it was coined by a wonderful woman who I was just on the phone with, um, in the UK named Jill Rapley. Um, but the reality is, is that it's probably how babies were fed before all the blenders and all the fancy machines and the Vitamixes and everything else that makes a puree because making that kind of consistency from a food, unless it's a soup. Um, was really hard back in the day. And actually, um, even back in the 1800s, they didn't start solids. The average age of babies starting solids was around 11 months. They were starting much later. They breastfed much longer and starting solids much later. Now, the modern sort of, you know, agreement um, and consensus in the medical medical community today is to start around six months old when the iron reserves um, that the baby has from their mother um, start to drop. And iron is a pretty critical nutrient for babies um, to grow properly. So, um, you know, six months is sort of the the mark at which we like to see babies start solid foods. Just so happens it's when they're able to reach for something and put it in their mouth quite accurately, as well as to munch and start to swallow without that tongue thrust that you see younger babies have, or they're constantly kind of pushing food or um, other things forward. But, you know, rice cereal came about because um, we needed a food that had iron in it. So the, 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 the mm-hmm. only benefit, in my opinion, to rice cereal is that it is fortified with iron. Um, unfortunately, it also has arsenic and other toxic metals in it because rice as a plant takes up a lot of toxic metals from the soil, um, even if it's organically grown. So it's a really inferior product as a first food on a number of levels, not to mention bland and, you know, textureless and does zero, you know, nothing for oral development. But um, in terms of how we got here, it's probably, you know, trace it back. It looks at, you know, you look at nutrition and how um, the needs of, of babies kind of developed over, over the years. I did not know that about the iron and that's maybe why. And we look back to times where people really might've been iron deficiency, but you, you also mm-hmm. said something about the tongue thrust. So would that yeah. be a sign 
if someone is trying to get their baby, because I actually have heard there's some pediatricians I know in New York that were suggesting solids around certain four months. So yeah. are we looking, instead of just having a hard, like, four months, six months, I'm assuming we want, especially for, I love, first of all, I'm a Montessori parent. Both my kids did Montessori, so I, I nice. did the punch. So yeah. <laughs> I'm there. So <laughs> are we looking, instead of setting a marker four months, six months, I'm assuming mm-hmm. we want to look at the child and see what their habits are. So yeah. if, you, if they try solids and they have that tongue thrust pushing it forward, would that be a sign not ready or is that just them working it out? Um, there's a little bit of a differing opinion around tongue thrust. I don't want to get too detailed um, for our purposes here, but basically what you want to look for, um, yes, you're absolutely right. Like there are, there are signs that your baby is ready for solids and this is includes um, being able to sit up properly with minimal support. Um, so, you know, not kind of toppling over the minute they're sitting. It's a lot of core um, muscle strength to actually sit, especially when you haven't been doing it, um, all your life as a baby, it takes a lot of energy and it's really hard for them. Um, it's really important for safety. But the other thing that people don't really know about is that you cannot use your fine motor skills. So like the grasping with your fingers and those sort of smaller movements with your arms, bringing something to your mouth without your core being stable. And I'm realizing I'm speaking to a yoga audience here. So like that might actually make sense. Like if your middle is all over the place, like after a pregnancy, for example, it's actually harder to do all those other smaller movements. You need that core strength to make that possible. Um, so sitting is, is the first one. Um, Head control is the second. You know, we don't want to have a baby sitting up and having their head bobbing around and bouncing around. They need to be able to hold their head upright and steady um, for the duration of the meal. And the best preparation for that is tummy time. So as much, you know, as your baby will tolerate um, throughout the day is a really great way of both um, getting towards sitting and good head control. Um, And then the other two um, sort of lesser important uh, signs that we like to look for. One is called reach and grab. So is your baby reaching for toys and teething on them, bringing them accurately to the mouth? That is obviously required if you're going to ask your baby to self-feed. Um, and just you know, interest, you know, are they watching you when you eat? Do they express some interest? Um, those are usually the four things that we look for. The tongue thrust um, actually can take a little bit longer time to disappear. And it's quite a gradual thing in my personal experience observing it with um, fraternal twins, for example, their their thrust didn't quite go away until like seven and a half months, um, but they were swallowing occasionally. So it's a less um, reliable uh, kind of indicator. So, you know, you want to make sure your baby's strong enough, interested, and able to accurately bring food uh, to their mouth, basically. Um, the four months, you know, start at four months with rice seal recommendation. I'm just going to say this now, if your doctor is suggesting that, and unless there is some medical reason for the early introduction of solids, um, it's dated advice. Um, All the major medical institutions in the United States um, suggest six months. So might be time to get a new doctor. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is I'm not going to out any doctor, but that doctor happens to be kind of one of the quote unquote alternative doctors that practice. Interesting. I so. mean, look, it's still happening a lot. No, I'm not, um, I'm not, and I, I'm and not I trying think, to you know, like look, argue. They're concerned just... about iron levels. There's, you know, that's certainly one way of doing it but formula is too. Um, But uh, all the major medical institutions, the American Academy of Pediatrics and so forth, recommend starting at six months. And actually, there are studies that show that too early of solids introductions, you know, three, four months, five months is probably less of a concern, but three or four months um, can actually lead to some other problems down the road. That is so interesting. No, I wasn't trying to argue. It's just interesting to me that the certain <laughs> practice that those that are listening that knew the New York, the New York pediatrician stories might be like, oh, okay, I'm putting it together. Yeah. So <laughs> what are the benefits? So I guess independence, you love again, you're kind of mm-hmm. referencing the Montessori, which is all about independence. Is yeah. that like, so independence, can babies get confidence? Like, is that so like, what are the benefits of baby led weaning? So from my perspective, the benefit of independence is that you don't have to sit there feeding your child. You can enjoy your meal at the same time. So that's a huge benefit in my book as a parent. Yeah. Especially when you have multiple. 
Yes. And like for New York parents, especially if you're going out to eat, if we can ever go out to eat again, um, you know, it's much more enjoyable experience. You can kind of just give a little bit of what's on your plate. I mean, it's, it's that easy. Oh, here's a piece of steamed broccoli. Here's some potatoes. Here's a piece of meat you can chew and suck on. Um, those are all perfectly appropriate, uh, first foods for our babies. So, and, but the independence, I mean, it, it carries so much further. I will tell you that the twins that I have who started solids with finger food, um, compared to my son who started with aggressive controlled spoon feeding and only spoon feeding are more independent babies. Um, now has my rearing probably changed over time? Sure. You know, I'm more experienced. I kind of know what I'm doing second time around. Um, but they just are more independent. And I really think that makes them happier babies because I think we all kind of want control, even at six months old, it turns out. Um, so that's a really big benefit. Um, the sort of other more practical things um, from a development perspective, um, babies who um, are introduced with, you know, who, who have finger foods introduced to them early on tend to be um uh, they're more advanced from an oral development. They're going to be better chewers. They are going to move food around in their mouths more efficiently and effectively. They're going to be better swallowers. Um, the feeding therapists that we have on our team who are um, experts in the neurobiology of swallowing and, and all of that um, have, you know, asserted a number of times that they have, you know, very little concern around choking with babies who were started with baby led weaning or finger foods. It's the spoon fed kids they worry about mm -hmm. because they lack the um, sort of oral skills to move food around properly and to swallow. And actually just to give you kind of an uncomfortable example, um, I was outside with my kids and our blueberries are starting to grow. I have a blueberry plant on our deck and um, my four-year-old was gagging on the blueberries while my twins were just like popping them down the whole, whole blueberries. Um, and that's because the, the, the feeling on his tongue, even at four years old was still uncomfortable for him. Um, he didn't quite know how, how to deal with this rolling thing in his mouth. So, um, you know, oral development is huge and it's, it's funny. Like if you give a baby something like a mango pit with just like a little bit of fruit on it, um, you know, left on it, or even like a cob from a corn on the cob with some corn shaved off, or even just the whole cob is fine too. Um, they're like, you, like, you're going to get first like 15 minutes. You've never ever had to yourself <laughs> in a long time because they're going to be so into it and quiet and engaged, but they're really pressing down on these things and gaining some serious strength, even if they're not swallowing that food. So the oral development is a huge benefit. Um, in terms of the nutrition and um, kind of appetite control, um, studies have shown that babies who um, our self feeding tend to, um, kind of know when they're full and know when they're hungry to express that, um, and actually tend to eat exactly the right amount. It, it, it turns out they're incredibly good at regulating their own, um, kind of intake when you, when you let them. Um, whereas on the other hand, studies show that babies who have been spoon fed are actually often, um, overeating because, the, the parent is like, well, I got to finish this jar, right? I'm going to finish this one pouch or whatever it is. And the baby um, doesn't really have an opportunity to kind of catch up and be like, whoa, 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 I'm actually full. Um, so those are some of the benefits, that. but like the, the biggest thing, honestly, Deb, in my opinion, is that we're sitting down as a family and have been since the babies were six months old um, to eat dinner every single night together. And we're eating the same thing. Um, and it's, it's really kind of mind blowing when you think about, I mean, I know you had mentioned in your email and I had certainly been blending and pureeing <laughs> concoctions and freezing things in tiny little cubes and all of that, you know, with my firstborn, it's so much work. It was, and you it just, was like, like whole Sunday afternoon. Like we were It's in, a full-time job. And she it's thinks a full -time I thought job. I was doing the right thing. I was like, I was, of course. it was my first kid. My second kid, I had to admit, didn't do the same thing. Like we would <laughs> right. go to the farmer's market and I was like patting myself in the back. I'm like, look at me buying my organic yeah. kale and, and beets. Yeah. And then we'd go yeah. home and then I 
would steam them and you mentioned the Vitamix and then I'd put them in the Vitamix and then I'd freeze Mm -hmm. them and like Mm -hmm. it became and I was like I'm doing this for my kid look at me as a good mom and it was exhausting exhausting (laughs) and also setting up a kind of uh, precedent in your family that your child can eat and should be eating something different than you are. Yeah. So when we is did the not transition, eat beets. you know, <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many messages I get. So we have about 30,000 followers on Instagram now from launching a few months ago, completely through word of mouth. And every night and every morning I answer about 50 messages that start like this. I spoon fed my baby until 11 months old and now I want to switch to finger foods and my baby won't feed themselves. What do I do? And it's because they missed that window. There's that reach and grab window from six months on where babies want to put things in their mouth. It's kind of all they want to do. If you really remember back to six months of just picking things and chewing up, chewing on them, you know, whether they're teething or whatnot. Um, but that exploration, that 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 sort of hand to mouth exploration, exploration is really important. And with spoon fed babies, you're actually kind of asking the baby to put their hands behind their back because if you look at videos, and we've studied a number of videos with our therapists, our feeding therapists of six month olds, they will actually most of them will reach and try to grab the spoon from you. Well, that's what we did. We actually let him. We have uh, so many again. First kid has so Good. many pictures. Yeah, second kid nuts. We have pictures of one of my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> where he has beets smeared across his face. So we, we did nice. the puree, but then he had his own little grabby spoon. And nice. again, we, we always kept the shower curtain. Then it ended up under his high chair. But yeah, yeah. We, we did let him do that. And I'd say maybe an eighth of it ended up in his mouth. I don't really know uh-huh. how much. And that's, and that's totally fine. I think, you know, look, I think um, particularly as Americans, we worry a lot about consumption and nutrition and, you know, how many tablespoons of food should my baby be getting at lunch? versus, you know, snack, whatever. And the reality is that most babies will eat exactly what they need if you just let them and if you give them a number, uh, you know, enough choices to choose from. Um, So they're not just faced with, you know, a kale puree, for example. Um, But the other thing is that, you know, I think we forget in starting solids that Breast milk and formula are still the primary sources of nutrition all the way up until 12 months. Mm -hmm. Now, most babies who are doing baby led weaning or self-feeding in some way, or at least an early introduction of finger foods by nine months, which by the way, is when the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends you do it. And nobody talks about that. Mm. That's that's what baby food companies don't want you to know is that when we're, what we're talking about, this quote unquote method of self-feeding is for three months of time because by nine months, no matter how you started your baby on solids, they should be self-feeding with finger foods. And I really think that's important for us to educate the sort of broader audience on because we are seeing babies spoon fed some until 18 months old. Um, and you know, you're missing this window, but anyway, um, I, I'm trying to remember what we were talking about before, but I'm just taking um, notes because I didn't know that. And I'm such a nerd. <laughs> like I have a whole little like pad set up. I'm like, oh, this is like tongue thrust signs are like, it's just, no, I did not know that. I, okay. I feel like, and I've been around babies for almost two decades. I had no idea. Okay. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back. I do want to get your opinion on recommended first foods. We talked about it's the series. Cereal, the rice cereal, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay, but we'll be, we'll be right back. With Lucky Land slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. <gasps> no, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you Lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. With Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. <gasps> no, Lucky Land Casino. With cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. 
Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Okay, we are back. So we can let the rice cereal go. And so you, you, were, you gave the thumbs up to my, my kids' strength avocados. What else would be a great alternative in case people are just anxious about this? Yeah, definitely. So we have a number of guides um, around the foods on our website um, if folks really want to kind of dive deep on this. But generally, when you look for first foods, you want to make sure that it's easy for the baby to pick up and self-feed. Like in a way, that's almost the most important thing because you could have the most amazing, you know, whatever, salmon. Um, but if it's completely mashed in a way where a baby can't, you know, at six months old, they don't have those finger movements. They're grabbing things with their whole fist. Um, so it needs to be big enough soft enough and easy enough for them to kind of munch or suck on. So um, if your baby eats everything or if you want to introduce everything, uh, steak is a great first food, a really thick, huge piece of steak. Um, I have seen babies and they're just going to suck on it mostly. Because they don't have teeth, so they're going to come on it. Yeah, (laughs) and they're going to suck all the iron out of it. Um, and so that can be an amazing, and that's again, another 15 minutes of, of peace you'll have at the table because they'll be so happy. Um, avocados on our top 10, uh, foods for baby starting <laughs> solids, mostly because it's one of those foods that is just so good for you. It's so rich in healthy fats and, and that's what so babies good. need. They need fat, they need protein, um, and iron. So, um, some of my other favorite foods for babies, um, purple potatoes, I'm really obsessed with as an alternative to the regular sweet potato that we see babies eat way too much of. Um, It's basically another form of sweet potatoes, but it's brightly colored, which is a great thing to expose your baby to, bright colored vegetables at the start, um, and can be cut in gigantic wedges for them to kind of grab with a fist and and bring to their mouth to um, to munch on. Um, Some of the other, you know, I, I Greek yogurt, it's so perfect for babies because it really sticks to spoons nicely. If you're going to sort of preload a spoon and kind of either hand it over in the air or rest it on the edge of a bowl, um, it won't kind of drip off the spoon right away. It gives them like three seconds to figure it out and get it to their mouth. I love Greek yogurt for babies, also super healthy. Um, And prepare yourself. Chicken liver is probably the number one food you could feed your six-month-old baby. Um, It is so high high in iron. It cooks down beautifully soft, like in a very nice soft consistency, um, yet is really easy to hold. And it's just packed with nutrients, like the very specific nutrients that um, they need in particular. Um, eggs are also a great starter. Okay, let's go back to the chicken omelet. liver. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Right. So growing up as a Jewish girl, we had chopped liver at Passover. So I actually like it. And when I was pregnant, I got a little anemic. So I had to eat a lot of chopped liver, which I liked. So, Uh but how, how are you serving it? Like all I know about chicken liver is it was, it was put on a matzo cracker. So like, how are you doing this? Yeah. So you can do either two ways. I mean, saute it in some butter or olive oil and either slice it and just hand over thick slices so they can grab it with their fist. Um, Alternatively, you could throw it into, you know, your Cuisinart or whatever with some um, yogurt or olive oil and, you know, spread it onto a baby cracker or a thin rice cake and they'll lick it off or, or kind of munch it off. So, um, so it's an incredible so food for babies. I would have had no idea that it's such a super smart stinky. Idea. And most people are like, I'm feeding a baby chicken liver and I'm not having any of this, but I know it's good for them. So <laughs> we have a, we have a ladies who love liver hashtag uh, sort of theme starting with my daughter because she's obsessed with chicken liver. It's well, kind like of funny. I like chopped liver. I'm going to have to start doing that. Yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, for the vegetarians in your in your audience, I love steamed broccoli. It sounds so basic and boring, but all the little florets on um, the sort of head, the flower part of the broccoli, really fascinate babies. And it's kind of like almost psychedelic for them. They'll look at it and they'll be like, whoa, what are all these millions of little things going on in here? And it is so fun to watch a baby play with a head of steamed of steamed broccoli. So that's always super fun too. These are f- uh, absolutely fantastic suggestions. But I'm so curious if the piece is big enough that you're not worrying about choking. 
Cause I, mm-hmm. I am confused. Like I remember being yeah. told, um, my pediatrician's like, okay, so the, uh, almond is the perfect size to choke on. So when my son started mm-hmm. eating almonds, we started calling them the choking hazards. And then he didn't actually know the real name yeah. for years. He kept calling them choking <laughs> hazards. Can I have more choking hazards? Sure you can. Oh, that's so, so, funny. <laughs> <I know. laughs> so, so when you're giving chunks of steak and the liver, mm-hmm. are they big enough that they're more gumming on it? So how yeah, that exactly. Okay. So there's kind of this from, from six to nine months old, old, um, regardless of whether your baby has teeth or not, teeth are actually kind of irrelevant when it comes to starting solids, because the the first teeth to come in are those bunny teeth, the front, uh, tops and the front bottoms. Um, and if you think about what you chew with, that's not the teeth you chew with, you chew with your molars and molars come in well after the first birthday. So, um, the gums are very powerful and that's just a bit of a misconception that you need teeth to chew and process food. Um, so, um, when it comes to the, the right size of food, uh, for babies and, uh, minimizing the risk of choking, look, I think it's, it's a counterintuitive thing, but from six to nine months old, bigger is better. A whole, like half of a, a boiled or poached apple, the whole half seeds remove, stem remove, for your baby to hold with two fists and their kind of clawed fingers is um, far safer than a slice of raw apple. That makes um, sense. I get that. So, you know, you're, the, the, the diameter of a six-month-old's windpipe is about the size of a drinking straw. It's really small. Um, and for a true sort of obstruction of that airway to happen, something either needs to be able to form a plug over it, which is why peanut butter or any nut butter really is a choking hazard because it's sticky, or it needs to get stuck in that tube. So, you know, what I like to say to folks to kind of get them to get this aha moment around uh, food sizes with young babies is that your baby is far, your six-month-old baby is far more likely to accidentally choke on a green pea than a gigantic, like, strip of steak an inch thick and four inches long. Now, what inevitably happens around eight to nine months, depending on how strong the baby's jaws are and where their teeth are, is that they start tearing food, you know, pieces off of those big pieces, right? And usually those are pretty big pieces, which is actually a good thing because your your baby's not going to choke on, you know, an inch thick piece of food in their mouth. It's it's actually too big. Um they're going to to gag that forward. It's a, a sort of built-in uh, protection that mother nature gave us, right? Um, and the baby's gag reflex is really strong, and it's also further forward on the tongue. It's actually on the first third of your tongue, whereas for us, it's almost kind of near our tonsils, right? Um, so there's sort of a built-in protection to push food, two big pieces of food, forward and out, and most babies will spit that out. You can also coach your baby to spit it out by sticking your own tongue out and teaching them to do that, which I love. Um, to suggest to parents who are nervous about this. Um, so when your baby's getting close to that, like eight or nine month mark, it might be a bit later, depending on where they are, um, where they're consistently tearing off two big pieces of food and then spitting it out. Um, it's a really good time to move drastically down in size, even to shredded meat, for example. So going from a strip of steak, one inch thick or bigger, um, four inches long to, you know, um, shredded, like brisket would be amazing. For example, like shredded or finely chopped, um, braised meat is a great, uh, first meat for like the six, the nine months old and, and up. So, um, the other sort of developmental thing that happens in that stretch of time is around nine months, nine to 12 months, uh, babies develop their pincer grasp, which is where the pointer finger and the thumb uh, meat, and they're able to pick up smaller pieces of food. Um, and so that's a good time as well, if you're not sure when to move down in size, to then go down to small um, bite-sized pieces of food, as you would normally see for 
um, you know, first finger food. It's so interesting. So like bigger it's is better. It's not at the what beginning. I would have thought. It really, goes super small. It's almost counterintuitive what I would have thought. I would have thought purees and then and then smaller yeah. and then bigger, but it's actually yeah. you're saying go bigger than smaller. It makes now that you're explaining mm-hmm. it, it makes absolutely total sense. Yeah, and I mean from a practical perspective too, if you serve a six month old baby a whole bunch of like uh the tiny chopped bite-sized pieces of food, they can't actually pick it up. So not only is that going to lead to crying and frustration because that's frustrating, they want to eat it and they can't accurately pick it up. Um, it's actually more likely to be accidentally swallowed whole mm-hmm. um, because their chewing and sort of oral motor skills are not quite there yet at that age. So, you know, when you, when you, when I say like a big strip of steak, I mean a big strip of steak, like maybe even the the bone in there too, if the bone is soft enough and doesn't have any sharp edges. Um, and again, they're mostly going to like suck and munch, but those are great skills for a baby and they do get a fair amount of nutrition as well. Can you talk a little bit about, you mentioned that your two-year-old's kind of pop the blueberries down without a problem, but your four-year-old still kind of gagging. Can you talk a little bit about the difference for parents to know that gagging is a way, I guess it's gagging's better than choking, I guess we could say. Yeah. <laughs> yes, for sure. For sure. On a number of levels. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, and it, this happens so often, I'll get a message from a mom saying, I just started baby led weaning today, but my husband saw the baby gag and thought she was choking. And so now we're back to purees. And I, I'm always like, oh, my head just my, you know, my head kind of falls into my hand when I see that because often the baby's not choking at all. Um, and in fact, I've, I have a mom in my community who's a 911 operator. And we had an interesting conversation about this. And she said, we get so many calls from parents starting solids and they say, my baby's choking, my baby's choking, my baby's choking, but they can hear the baby crying in the background, which by definition, your baby cannot cry if they're choking um, because the airway has to be totally obstructed for them to be choking. So I think we, we tend to think gagging is like this precursor to choking when actually they're two completely separate things going on. Um, True choking is when the airway is completely obstructed and your baby cannot breathe or is having trouble breathing. Um, You know, typically you're going to see um, a baby have really wide eyes, like looking terrified. um, And that's often kind of eerily quiet uh, because they can't scream or gasp or, you know, they're not making any sounds. Because my, I think my son, my son, I gave him um, mango once. This is really little, probably like maybe, maybe it's a 12 to 14 fruit. and yeah. 12 to 14 months. And I gave it to him. It was frozen mango, got soft. And all of a sudden it got quiet. His eyes got wide. He brought his hands to yeah. his throat and then yeah. I whacked his back and it came out. Yeah. Was that gagging nice. or choking? That was probably choking. Oh, okay. That's what I thought. But I was hoping it was gagging. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's alive yeah. now. He's upstairs sleeping. Yeah. But, um, but that, yeah. yeah. No, gagging is, you're going to see it. You're going to kind of hear it. Um, gagging is just that protective reflex where it's just the, the back of the, <clears throat> the throat is contracting to push something forward. Um, so there, the, the mouth is usually open. And there, the tongue is a little bit out and, you know, kind of seeing the, the body kind of almost like spasm to push that, that food out. And it's really important if it's just gagging, um, to let your baby try to work that food forward on their own, because what you know, the medical community, um, is, is telling everyone and seeing it that when parents put their fingers in their baby's mouth, they often inadvertently push push the food further back. Exactly. Which worsens, um, the problem. And also from a less serious perspective, it's a really kind of invasive thing for a baby to feel, uh, in a feeding thing. So, um, yeah, I think it's really important to know the difference between gagging and choking. And tr- honestly, the best way you can kind of get comfortable with it for parents who are interested in exploring a finger food first kind of approach to solids is to watch videos. Um, mm-hmm. So we have, for example, in our free food database on our website, there'll be 1000 foods you can feed your baby before age two. And every page, every food page 
has its own kind of dedicated section of how to introduce this food to your baby by age. So how to cut it for a six month old versus an 18 month old, whether it's an allergen, is it a choking hazard, um, et cetera, et cetera. And um, it has a video or two of different age babies eating that food. And I love gagging videos because they're so helpful for parents to see the babies recover. And often the babies who are gagging, even the really bad gags, they're like, oh, okay, that's over. Can I have more food, please? And they're shoveling it back in and they go right back for more. Um, So I think watching videos of babies gagging, educating yourself on the difference between choking and gagging and for sure CPR so that you have the confidence that you know what to do with the kind of back blows, whatever it is for the age of your baby. Um, those are like the most important things you can do because if your confidence is completely shaken, um, you're likely going to have a fear-based approach to introducing food to your child. And whether you like it or not, I guarantee that will lead to problems down the road. Thank you so much for talking about the two because it it can be upsetting. Like you don't know what they're doing, choking or gagging. It's so hard to watch and it's so hard not to do something. We're wired to leap in and to, you know, to help them. Um, But the reality is if if it's gagging, if it's gagging and just gagging, um, there's a built, a very strong built-in reflex for are so babies. Smart. <laughs> and the baby, your baby's going to gag for a good two months, maybe more. That's another thing. Like you can't avoid it. It's just a matter of when <laughs> four years old or six months old. <laughs> right, now you, you mentioned something that I want to pull out for a conversation a little bit more your allergens. It's yeah. such a hot topic. I mean, again, I'm feeling like an old person when I was in school, but when I was in school, <laughs> everyone had yeah. peanut butter and jelly. Like that was just it. Yeah. And now things are so yeah. nut free. And I know that at Solid Starts, you guys really know your allergen stuff. And I won't ask you too much for specifics, but can we talk a little bit about that? Like when to introduce. Mm-hmm. I remember our doctor's like, okay, do introduce peanut butter while the day that I'm in the office so we can have a talk if it makes you feel better. Like, so we were real, and, and my kid eats peanut butter like literally by the spoonful. So thankfully we don't have a, a nut allergy, but can you, can right. you take some of the, the fear away about, you gave me a few specifics about like tree nut allergies. It's not mm-hmm. as big as we think. Um, <clears throat> how many kids approximately like give me a little bit of the lowdown on allergens yeah so i mean look you know i think that there is a real valid fear around allergens because some of them are very very serious Mm -hmm. and they are increasing um globally and within the united states um that said i think that our fear has become a little bit out of proportion with reality, right? So, um, you know, you talked about tree nuts, for example. It is the vast majority, more than 90% of, of kids are not going to have a tree nut allergy. Now, peanuts a bit different. Um, the, the statistics are a bit higher. Um, but in general, about 1 in 13 kids have a food allergy um, with cow's milk and egg uh, being the most common. Now, the good news is, is that you often outgrow a dairy, um, an egg or egg allergy. Um, so, you know, the, the percentage of kids left with, uh, an allergy is even smaller, but, you know, I think, um, to set the stage, uh, if I may, the, the history has changed and the recommendations from the medical community has drastically changed over the course of the last 20 years. So, you know, at the beginning um, of, you know, 2000, 2000, 2001, the general recommendation was to avoid allergens until your child was three. Um, for, For almost all allergens, your pediatrician would have told you, don't introduce allergens, wait until they're three, blah, blah, blah. Well, what happened in that time period is allergies increased about 80%. And then a sort of groundbreaking study came out um, around the early introduction of peanuts and tested this theory of what would happen, you know, or why in communities where peanuts are, you know, sort of common, uh, West Africa, for example, why are peanut allergies, you know, not happening um, in, in, in those countries? So 
um, the the study showed that the early in, the early introduction of peanuts to children at risk of peanut allergy. So what does that mean? They have probably have eczema. They have other sort of indicators for an allergy likely to develop. Um, could prevent could prevent the peanut allergy from developing um, more than eighty percent. So then the medical community are like, whoa, we had it all wrong. <laughs> now it's early introduction, early and often starting at six months old and even younger for babies who, um, you know, whose pediatricians may feel or allergists may feel they, they are likely to have a dairy allergy or a peanut allergy based on family history or, you know, um, exposure through breast milk or whatnot. So, um, the general uh, guideline now from the American Academy of Pediatrics is to introduce um, peanuts before a baby's first birthday, um, you know, preferably starting around six months. Um, and basically, they've declared there's no reason to delay the introduction of any other allergen. So um, we kind of have lumped all of that into early and often and do everything early and often. But the reality is that there's only one quote unquote preventative study, and that's on peanuts. For tree nuts, um, they're generally treating it like a peanut and saying early and often is the way to go. Most people, most allergists in the allerg allergist community. Um, but with shellfish, for example, that's an allergy that can develop uh, later in life, much later in life, 20s in your 20s or 30s even. So um, the, the jury verdict is kind of out on, on shellfish. But generally, uh, most pediatric allergists, if they're sort of progressive in nature, will tell you to do the food allergens early and often. Oh, I think that's so liberating. Now, random question you may not know. I'm getting kind of specific. Do you know if yeah. it's hereditary? Like if a parent has an allergy yeah. that the child Yeah, may? absolutely. So we don't know everything about why certain people have allergies. What we do know is that um, there are certain... Uh, uh, sort of indicators that put you more at risk of, of being allergic to certain foods. So um, having eczema, um, severe eczema is one of those, and family history is certainly another. This is so interesting. I'm going to start to wrap it up because I could really go down a rabbit hole with all this. But it's yeah, so, I know, it's I so know. It's interesting. All right, we're going to take a super quick break. And when we come back, if you can offer one tip or piece of advice you'd like to offer in your expectant parents, you have three kids, you've been doing this for a while, I'm sure you have something wonderful to offer. We'll be right back. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. Ch -ch 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 -chumba. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Ch -ch 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 -chumba. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Forward, prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. All right. So it could be food related. It could be because you're a parent of twins. That's, that's a handful. What would you, like, <laughs> what would you yeah. like to offer? As no, I know exactly what I want to say Great. and it's get out of the way hmm. for so many we, things. <laughs> babies for so many things. Babies were born to eat. They know how to eat instinctively, and if given the chance, they will do a phenomenal job at it. Um, yeah, I think I was reading the New York Times or some some media site a couple months ago, and it, it kind of declared this generation of mothers as like the age of total motherhood. You know, we are the everything mothers. We do everything. We're going to make sure that our child has the best education and the best after school classes and the best pureed organic kale from the farmer's market. It's exhausting you know, to try to be everything. It's, it's exhausting. <laughs> and it's and unrealistic. it's also not necessarily good for the child. No. Um, so my, my tip would be to, if it's starting to feel hard to question whether you might actually be doing too much, and to look at ways that you can encourage independence, whether that's them pulling up their own pull-up or eventually tying their own shoes 
um, or learning to hold their, their own glass cup for the first time. Get out of the way. Yes, I absolutely love that. I stand by that. We started that early. We continue that. I often say, I am your mom, not your servant. Do it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so you have amazing, amazing work and solid starts. I went deep into all of your Instagram, all your posts, your, your website. Talk about where people can find your work. Sure. So the free food database that I mentioned um, is on our website, solidstarts.com. It's plural, solidstarts.com. And then um, I do most of our social media on Instagram right now. You do so it all yourself? That, so I do. With your so three kids, with your company? You're doing, yeah. <laughs> well, you do I it do. very well. I feel like I have to. I'm learning so much because that's where all the the sort of good nuggets of feedback are. You know, it's it's one thing to like hear from a mom the worries that they have, like straight through that message than to have like your assistant tell you there's a lot of moms worried about X. It's a completely different experience. So right now for me, that feels like the right thing to do. But yes, I'm a little tired. <laughs> So at Solid Starts on Instagram is where most of the action is. Um, and the, the free food database is on our website. And I'll make sure all of this will be on the show notes. Jenny, I had the most delightful time chatting with you. Thank you so much for carving out a little time in your very, very busy day to <laughs> chat with me. Thank you for having me, Deb. It was a hoot. <laughs> Good. All right. Well, be well. Enjoy your evening. Bye. You too. This has been an episode of Yoga Birth Babies, produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. You can catch us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Thanks for listening. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.